So today uh, we have uh, Merlin now, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, techniques on, on quantum annealing for uh, medical imaging. So Merlin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen. You should be able to see the screen now, right? Yes. OK. okay. Thanks, Paul, for the nice introduction. Thank you also for having me in your seminar series here. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, hybrid quantum annealing for tomographic image reconstruction in particular, uh, talk about the opportunities and the current limitations that we faced. Uh, to start off, uh, I would like to say that I'm not a physicist by training. I'm a medical engineer uh, focusing on most the image and data processing. So when we got started with this topic, we kind of saw the opportunities of quantum computing, in particular already quantum annealing, and we wanted to try it out ourselves. And we were looking for a suitable problem that we could map to the quantum annealer uh, in a way that we can solve something that we do in our everyday practice, which is homographic image reconstruction. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, the team um, that consists primarily of the Siemens Health Neuroscience uh, of Alexander Hans Wicher, Wes Gorn, and Maximilian Reimann, who are working on SPECT uh, research. Um, I will get more into that topic in a bit. And then uh, the side of uh, my lab at the Friedrich Alexander Universität uh, Erlang Nürnberg, uh, where I'm supervised by Professor Andreas Meyer. So, um, as some of you may not are not too familiar with functional or molecular imaging, I just want to get a quick overview of what is actually done. So in functional or molecular imaging, we are not interested in actually imaging the anatomy of the patient as you do, for example, in CT or MR, but we are rather interested in the physiology of the patient. So where do things actually happen in the body? And in order to do that, um, the most common um, molecular imaging techniques, namely SPECT and PET, they work with uh, radiopharmaceuticals. So you start off with injecting a small amount of a radiopharmaceutical to a patient. This consists of an isotope, which is bound to some kind of tracer, which brings the isotope to the target destination, maybe the heart or the brain. And then once this uh, isotope has settled in, in the designated area, you perform a SPECT uh, CT or a PET CT scan. And you can kind of see an illustration of this on the right side. So you have the patient who is basically, um, you know, pushed into uh, our SPECT CT scanner. And then you have these two gamma ray detectors, which are in this kind of green bluish tone. And they are now capturing the gamma photons flying in and they have a color in front such that we can narrow down the direction of where those photons are coming from. And then once you have performed that scan, you also do a CT to do uh, an attenuation correction. So you know how the, the photons are attenuated at different parts in the image. And then after you do a visual and quantitative interpretation of these 3D images, which is then, of course, left to the medical doctor. I just want to go uh, into a, a specific, very specific example, but kind of just to showcase you what some of these images may look like. So let's... Um, throw away all of the medical terms um, right now away. In principle, here we have a patient who has uh, some kind of facet arthropathy. So this is a condition that affects the joints in the spine called the facet joints. And these joints are located on either side of the spine and they provide uh, for stability and movement. And facet arthropathy now occurs when the cartilage in these joints actually wears down. And this is then usually associated with back pain. But here we have a patient who has a lot of screws um, driven into his spine. And what we are now interested in, we can uh, do a lot of different imaging techniques. So on the top left, you can see the expect reconstruction. So this shows the uh, now the distribution of this radioactive tracer. And if you have a, uh, a spot with a lot of activity, this means there is a lot of uh, degeneration happening in the bone. On the bottom, you can see the CT where you can see all of the screws that are screwed into the patient. Now, there are, of course, some medical artifact reduction techniques that are being applied to improve the image contrast. 
But what is really crucial on the right side of the image, where you can see this kind of purplish visualization, you can see that this um, screw in the four facet joint, you can see that there is more activity um, around the screw. And this symbolizes that there is a uh, degeneration happening in the bone. And this is something that we can now see with this physiology changing, but the anatomy might have not changed. Here are some more images of this, and you can see this a little bit clearer on the right side, that there is really some degeneration happening there. And the what what is the, you know, the consequence is that the screw is loosening. So this is one scenario where we use our functional imaging techniques to actually improve the patient outcome. And this functional imaging what I just said, it measures the physiological change before the anatomical change occurs. And this ideally leads then to an earlier diagnosis, an earlier treatment, an earlier treatment adaptant, such that we have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And you can see kind of a buildup of, of, of the imaging techniques here, where we have the anatomical uh, imaging side, uh, which is a CT or MR, and then we have the physiology, and then here somewhere between the physiology and the metabolism, we have SPECT and PET. Now, this was just kind of a motivation where all of this imagery construction can be applied to, and that it actually is a crucial task for medical doctors, um, and it actually affects a lot of people. Now, when we were looking at this problem of imagery construction, we kind of had to take a lot of steps back to make this problem suitable, such that we can embed this on a quantum annealer and actually get it to work with the current hardware that we have. So now I kind of want to make the problem a little bit more mathematical. You remember we had the patient that is being you know, pushed into the tube and then imaged from around. So we capture actually projection views of the patient. Now let's imagine that X is now our patient. And this is some kind of true activity distribution that we have. And each of these um, voxel elements now contains an average number of photons, which is being emitted from this voxel. Now, when we capture these projection views going around the patient, what uh, we actually end up with are these projection images. So you can see them uh, denoted here as Y0, Y1, Y2. So this is the detector. And the photons from X0, X1, and X2, they would now fly into Y0, uh, X3, X4, X5, into Y1, and so on and so forth. This is very simplified because in spec, you actually have a collimator, which actually has a little bit larger acceptance angle. But again, we had to make the problem just a little bit smaller uh, in the beginning to start off with. So we have our measurements. And now what we need to know how are these projections generated? And the relationship between the measurements that we have and the true activity distributions that we have can be described by a system matrix. And the system matrix basically is the transition from the image space to the measurement space. And um, one element of this matrix then basically is the probability of a photon that is being emitted in a voxel I is recorded in the data bin J of our measurements. Now, in reality, we don't know the true system matrix. We don't know how exactly this is um, happening when we are doing the image. So what we can only do is we can have an estimate of this system matrix, some kind of model that we perform by incorporating physics and um, also maybe anatomical information of the patient when we do attenuation correction. What is really a big problem in emission tomography is that it is an ill-posed inverse problem. And this is due to many reasons, but one of the primary reasons is that we have noise which is coming into our measurements. And this is commonly um, expressed with an additive noise. So our measurements are compromised of the system matrix times the uh, true activity distribution plus some kind of additive noise. So if, if we would want to actually, you know, get back to our true activity distribution, we would have to do 
a lot of measurements and a lot of reconstructions that we end up with the mean or the expectation value of um, our true image or our true activity distribution. Now, what reconstruction techniques now typically do, um, iterative reconstruction techniques at the current, they try to minimize some kind of least square form between the estimated system, then the reconstruction, which is now noted as X tilde, minus the measurements that we actually take. So we actually try to minimize that difference such that our reconstructed image is leading to the measurements that we took and that it has a high probability that these measurements were actually generated from the reconstructed activity distribution. And now in this form now, it may look like it is a very simple um, linear systems type of equation. And uh, one could you know, just use the inverse of the matrix. However, in practice, this is infeasible because as I said, it's an ill post inverse problem and um, the matrix that we have M can be extremely large. So uh, calculating even the pseudo inverse of this is kind of impossible. But for a toy problem, like we constructed, it is enough to say we have a system matrix. Um, we can describe this matrix. We can incorporate different kind of physical attributes. And then we use this to do our simulations. Now, um, we stumbled upon the topic of quantum annealing when we kind of gotten to know about the topic of quantum computing a while ago. This was like three or four years ago. And um, we saw that D-Wave is a company that already offers uh, commercial quantum annealers that you can use, you can access via the cloud, and it presents a new algorithmic paradigm. And for us, the core difference is it is different to classical computing because it uses some kind of quantum mechanical phenomena such as entanglement and superposition, and the hardware advances really quickly. So when we go to our problem and we really now take this as a toy problem as this linear systems of equations. Our forward problem is defined, as I said earlier, m times x equals y. And then our inverse problem should be solved by taking the inverse of the system matrix. So now we took a look at what kind of algorithms were out there for quantum computing that could be used to solve these um, linear systems of equations. And one of the first ones that we stumbled on was the Harold Hasidim Lloyd algorithm, which runs on gate based hardware. However, it is kind of infeasible because it's not running on NISC hardware. Um, it is can is it is restrained to is restricted to um, low condition matrices, and we don't have that in our problem. So this was not a feasible option. The quantum approximate optimization algorithm is another um, algorithm used for binary optimization, and this is kind of in a similar structure as the Cubo formulation that we use for our uh, quantum annealers. But the paper that really got us kind of interested in the topic was this matrix inversion on quantum annealers, which was proposed by Rogers and Singleton in 2020. And they basically analyzed the, um, the, the, what, what, what you could actually solve with the quantum annealers. And they solved just two by two, three by three uh, matrices and solved them uh, for a, sy a system of linear equations. Now, um, we wanted to, investigate this approach a little bit further and see if it would be applicable to the scenario that we actually have. So we took a look at what kind of stuff is being done with quantum computing and medical imaging so far. And there is happening quite a lot in the, especially in the past two years, mostly uh, the papers that are, that, that came out, they focus on classification with, for example, quantum neural networks or quantum support vector machines. But also, um, e Wave provided a tutorial on image segmentation on their website. And for reconstruction, there were already also papers out there, including this uh, paper by uh, Kiani et al., which was kind of the kickstart to quantum medical imaging algorithms, which dealt with inverse integral transforms um, back in the day. And then also June et al., they proposed a paper for solving um, quantum, uh, for solving image reconstruction with a quantum optimization approach, similar with QAOA or also quantum annealing. And then we have our um, recently proposed algebraic formulation, which consists of this 
you know, y equals m times x. So when we want to formulate this, this problem for the quantum annealer, we first have to take a look what kind of problems can the quantum annealer actually uh, solve. And, and, and the problems that our quantum annealer is good at are these quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. So we have some kind of linear part. We have our um, xi, our, our pixels in our world, our variables that we want to solve for, which are binary. So they're either one or zero. And then we have the quadratic interactions between the different uh, pixels, basically, which are then described all by this, this, this cubo matrix Q. And we want to solve our problem as the simple mx minus y squared. So we kind of want to um, we kind of underestimate at least square solution to the problem. So if we think about this now, we can use a linearized binary image. So instead of making it 2D, we can just vectorize it. And we then say our pixels are restricted to being either zero or one, which may not sound like a valid case at first, but there are, for example, um, techniques in transmission tomography um, specifically for non-destructive test testing. So imagine you have some kind of object which is compromised of only one material. It will be just a binary value in those pixels. So this is a legitimate uh, assumption that we can make in the beginning. We then have our linearized projections and the matrix. And we can see that um, the equation, it contains at maximum quadratic interactions. So this is something that when we reformulate this, we can directly make this into a cubo kind of problem. So how can we formulate this problem for the quantum annealer? And how is this compatible with the D-wave systems that they offer? Well, the first approach would, as I just showed in the last slide, would be to just embed this as a binary problem. And then we can just directly uh, kind of embed this problem and put it on the quantum needler. We could also embed this as an integer problem. So imagine that we have our pixels, which are not then just binary valued, but we could then form, uh, formulate this as, for example, a power series and taking multiple uh, of the qubits to uh, represent uh, one integer number, basically, of course, restricted to a specific range. Uh, and then D-Wave, they also offer in their um, commercial ocean program this uh, their hybrid solvers. And their hybrid solvers kind of want to utilize um, you know, the best of both worlds of classical computing and quantum annealing. And they use their quantum annealers to drive the classical solution to a better estimate. However, um, we cannot see under the hood. So we don't know exactly what is happening. But this was something that we could boost up our problem size and see if it actually works for some kind of bigger images. Because as I will show you in the next slides, for the um, binary problem, this is quite restricted. So let's take just the example that we have a kind of four by four image. So we have now um, these different pixels and we can already see that this graph is quite fully connected. So we don't actually exploit the topology of the D-Wave chip enough. So our problem is not really, it's not really suited, right? It's 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 a fully connected graph and the um, size of the fully connected graphs that you can embed on the D-Wave hardware is limited currently. So already when we go to an image size of eight by eight, we can see that the uh, solution occurrences associated with the energy, they don't really point to a particular solution. We don't see that there is a that there is more numbers of occurrences happening for the um, solution which is associated with energy, which has been the case for the four by four image. So we could reconstruct four by four images. That was no problem, but four by four images are really, really small, and you cannot really take any information from that. We decided to use those uh, hybrid solvers that D-Wave um, offers, and they enable, um, in addition to making uh, binary quadratic models, they also enable uh, constrained quadratic models. So you can make uh, the variables binary, discrete, integer, or even float uh, valued um, for your problem setting. And then you can further add equality, inequality constraints, restrict the um, 
the parameter, uh, the, the, the integer uh, range, basically, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of what we then use as our tip point to get started. So for the binary quadratic model, we still use this uh, embedding, which we use for the quantum annealer, but just use it on the hybrid models for the integer valued reconstruction, which I will show we use their uh, constrained quadratic models. So um, let us just take a look at kind of what this reconstruction workflow is. So we actually start with the data acquisition. So we simulate um, our measurements um, um, on, on, on a very simple binary image. We then embed the problem on, as, as a cube of problem and embed it um, on the hybrid solvers, then reconstruct. And then after we perform uh, some kind of analysis, um, which um, should, yeah, which was extremely useful for us because then we can compare with the state of the art methods which are being used for image reconstruction at, at, at this very point. And for this uh, hybrid model, um, I gave a D-Wave uh, webinar and I quickly wanted to go into the um, creation of this constrained quadratic model here because I'm sure most of you are familiar how this binary quadratic model works with setting up the cubo matrix. So um, the constrained quadratic model, you need to create an object function basically to minimize. So here you can exactly see what we have pointed out in the previous slides. We make some kind of expression which defines as a least square uh, optimization problem. We then create our integer variables. We set the objective. And we then sample from this hybrid sampler, obtaining a sample set, filter it for feasible samples. And then we always chose the solution, which was associated with the lowest energy. What is interesting in comparison to classical computing is that with the sampler, we are being returned a sample set of multiple solutions. So one nice attribute that this now has is we can actually also Create some kind of uncertainty map of the problem. So we know where the solver is very, very certain for specific uh, pixels and where it is not. So we decided to kind of now evaluate this on three different kinds of components, each very crucial for reconstruction. The first one is image size. We were looking in how large can we actually make those images for the hybrid solver. Um, and um, then secondly, we wanted to test it on noise. So what happens if we actually add noise to our measurements? Because this is, as I pointed out earlier, a big problem in emission tomography. And then the third one is actually reconstructing from as few projection images as possible, which is uh, desirable because you don't want to harm the patient uh, for too long. And, it actually results in you know shorter scanning times and ideally also less radiation for the patient. So let us take a look at these uh, hybrid quantum annealing um, assisted reconstruction for the binary images. We could see that for the four binary uh, images that we have when we embed this on a on a binary quadratic model, because we discretize it a lot. It may not be super comparable to the other techniques because they are developed for large image sizes, say 128 by 128 or even bigger. But um, it showed that with the with the with the quantum annealing in this really like noise-free setting, we could reconstruct images up, up to 32 by 32. And now the restriction of this 32 by 32, it does not come from the um from, from the actual problem solving, but it comes from creating the problem because we are dealing with these matrices. And imagine that this M, it really blows up in size because we always have the square of the image size and the square of the projection uh, measurements. So this really blows up specifically for large three-dimensional problems. But we were here kind of faced at the resolution of 32 by 32, which is an okay, okay-ish uh, image size to work with. And we could see that uh, compared with the, the root mean square error, uh, our uh, reconstruction technique was just as good as taking the pseudo inverse, which kind of um, showed us that we could use this to solve very, very easy um, images. Now, when we went on to integers, 
we could see that it kind of works for small images, four by four, eight by eight, but even from eight by eight, um, we saw that our measurements are not that reliable anymore. And especially if you look at this 32 by 32 image, this is a Shablogan phantom. It's a very uh, famous phantom used in, in, in medical imaging. But what we were kind of only able to do was resolve these kind of blackish regions in the middle. And all of the rest kind of, to us, it looks like noise. Um, so this kind of um, showed us the limitation of these integer value problems on the constraint quadratic model. And that eight by eight is kind of the size that we cannot really uh, surpass, except if we would increase, for example, the solver time or add some kind of regularization techniques. But this was not the scope of the this first initial investigation. So uh, the noise evaluation, um, we actually uh, take into consideration a forward problem in uh, reality. And this is that in each projection that we make, we have in emission tomography, we have some kind of Poisson noise associated with the data. So we changed for each projection, we changed our input to a noisy input and then ended up with this Y noise, uh, basically having um, a noise component to it. And the way that we did that was because we were restricted to a pretty small range to just make kind of a, a random variable following a discrete uniform distribution. So we either subtracted one from the pixel, left it unaltered, added one, and then um, simulated our data. Now, when we look at those experiments with uh, the noise, <clears throat> when we have no noise, um, we were able to reconstruct uh, the images um, at no problem whatsoever. When we had noise, the images are still looking, they, they don't uh, contain the exact solution because that, that is quite a hard thing to do. But um, they resemble the uh, input images, the ground truth uh, quite well. Oh, and I'm 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 very sorry. I think I might have um, I might have um, went on this uh, a little bit too too fast. But uh, if we look at the uh, tables, we can see the ground truth on the left side. We can see the sinogram. So these are the measurements. We can see the filtered back projection, which is a very conventional reconstruction technique. And then we have SART, which is an iterative reconstruction technique, which is used a lot in uh, in, in 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 practice. Um, and then we have a PI, which uh, resembles our pseudo inverse uh, solution. So just taking the pseudo inverse of our matrix. Sorry for um, rushing too fast over this. Um, so when we took four bit integer digits with the noise, let's take a look at the reconstruction uh, root mean square, or how well this actually resembles the ground truth. So uh, in this eight by eight example, where we don't add any noise, we can see that our uh, hybrid uh, based solution is kind of doing okay. Uh, the pseudo inverse solution is doing uh, just fine without noise, of course, and the filter back projection is just a bit on top of that, as you would expect for discretized images, as the filter back projection works with interpolation operators is based on the Fourier transform and so on. And then the SART approach uh, was not really a feasible option to compare with because it is not working as well with this small discretized versions, and it's really made for larger scale problems. But as the pseudo inverse is kind of a feasible uh, option to compare with, we can also see that on the right side now, when we add uh, the noise to the image, we could see that our uh, hybrid based approach was kind of um, robust to the noise that we added. And this was an interesting finding that we took away from this. And this could be something which is actually of worth uh, in medical image reconstruction. Now, let's go to the last kind of experiment that we conducted. And this was uh, taking reconstruction when minimizing the views. Now, we can see, again, the same uh, binary images. Um, and the different uh, reconstruction techniques to reconstruct them. And now what we did was we did not only take, uh, we did not take a fully determined setting. So we don't have a quadratic matrix anymore, but we have um, yeah, a non-square, a non-quadratic a non, a non, um, 
matrix now. So we took two and four views basically, and then tried to reconstruct uh, from them. Now we can see that the, the, the filtered back projection is really not designed for this case. The filtered back projection basically lies upon this theorem of the Fourier slice theorem. Um, and this basically states that you need as many projections um, as you have points in your image in order to resolve the image. And the uh, SART approach is doing okay. It kind of uh, does not, um, uh, it does not uh, lead to a very, very good solution, but the, the shape is kind of um, still uh, retained. And the pseudo inverse solution now uh, does not manage to get as close to the ground truth as our hybrid quantum annealing based uh, solution. So we could actually see that if uh, I think this becomes very clear for the uh, upper two images. Um, the snowflake here for four views is, is resolved very, very well and almost perfectly resembles the ground truth. And the same goes for this tree, which is, can be seen here. And uh, the pseudo inverse and all other, other reconstruction techniques were not able to resolve this as well as this hybrid approach. And this was really an interesting finding. However, um, we see that this is working quite well for the top two images. If we, uh, for example, look at the lower two images, then uh, we have this kind of uh, foam image on the on the bottom left, and we could see that the uh, reconstruction of a hybrid-based approach um, kind of has more noise here. So the kind of conclusion that we took from this was that it is probably harder to resolve the inner parts of the phantom compared to the other ones, and that there might just be a problem with high frequency components in the image, which becomes clearer if we look at this kind of, I think this was described as a molecular, molecular structure um, on the bottom right, where we also have more noise in the reconstructions. But this is something that uh, we could really take away from, from this, and, and we uh, are interested in investigating this uh, further. Um, so really this reconstruction from few views and reconstruction uh, robustness under noise is really a desirable property to have for image reconstructions. So with this, I kind of want to come to uh, a conclusion and an outlook. So uh, what I've shown you today was that we could um, use um, D-Wave's hybrid solvers to solve simple tomographic image reconstructions. I've kind of pointed out the limitations of purely quantum annealing based uh, solutions and uh, why this was not really desirable for us to compare with. We kind of demonstrated a robustness to noise and also the ability to reconstruct for few few measurements, specifically for this uh, small toy problem that we kind of introduced throughout uh, this talk. And in the future, what we would like to do is explore other use cases with quantum annealing we have kind of gotten started with this. And one of the problems that we were actually able to map uh, on the quantum annealer purely was a feature selection problem. And uh, this was something that is, um, in, in my opinion, this was more suitable to, to map this to the quantum annealers, but I'm also curious maybe if some of you have any inputs on this uh, and if you know anything. And then um, kind of the larger stepstone was also to not only to stick to quantum annealing, but we were also Kind of taking investigations into uh, quantum computing and uh, uh, gate-based uh, quantum computers specifically in the direction of uh, quantum machine learning and i think i have not uh, shown it in the slides but um, there was a very recent paper that came, uh, that will come out at the computer vision pattern recognition conference next month and it focuses on super resolution uh, of images using quantum annealers and it comes from the, uh, the computer vision group from ETH Zurich. So this might be something to also keep an eye on um, in terms of computer vision problems for quantum annealing. So with this, I would like to conclude the talk. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, if anything was unclear, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, thank you so much.
Uh, excuse me. Let me ask a question. Oh. Uh, you said uh, you minimize the cost function like the uh, defined as like an x minus y. You yep. mean x that corresponds to the image. Exactly. But, uh, what I'd like to know is that there is a solution of the problem always unique, or no. if not, no. uh, if not, so how do you select the solution that corresponds to the true image? Yeah, um, I think that's a that's a valid point. So it would so I think it's very important to point out that for this uh, very toy problem in the beginning, the solution is unique. Um, so just from this uh, binary uh, kind of image size that we increase. The solution is uh, uniquely defined and it's not really ill post, but it was more to just see if it actually works. If we would, uh, if you take this example of the noise or the a few measurements um, or a realistic scenario, the, the solution is not unique anymore. And we chose the solution that was always associated with the lowest energy that we were being returned, even though this might not be the best solution in terms of root mean square error or uh, structural similarity, for example. Does that uh, answer so, the, the question? Uh, so, oh, sorry, I, I lost the camera. I, so, uh, if for the toy model, you uh, counter is such the solution is unique, but uh, if not, if uh, the solution is not unique, we can some other information to determine what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Okay. Exactly, exactly. But um, so so one, maybe also an interesting example. So in this, um, I don't I don't know what your background is, but in the CT image reconstruction uh, techniques, uh, people usually associate uh, the term uh, inverse crime with this problem of making it a, a very easy problem to solve. And that it has a unique solution. How you can avoid this problem, and we've also tried this with experiments, is that um, now you don't simulate the sinogram with the same sister matrix that you use for the reconstruction, but uh, you use a higher resolution image, and then you compute the sinogram with this, then just rebin the sinogram, so make it to the kind of the the, the size of um, your problem that you want to solve, and then you reconstruct with the other system matrix. And we have, uh, th there's there's no uh, results out there yet, but I can tell you that <laughs> I have run them and the results did not look bad. So you could still interpret the images. Um, of course, the resolution quality goes down, but this is the case for all of the reconstruction techniques when you change the uh, forward operator, basically. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question, if I may. Uh, yes, sure. This is uh, Marcin Dukowski from Aramco. Uh, thanks, Marilyn, for an uh, interesting talk. I, um, in the last set of uh, examples where you showed uh, reconstruction from fewer views, right? Yeah. That's from yeah. fewer fewer values of y, right? In your, exactly. Exactly. So fewer, fewer rows or columns, depending on which way you organize it. And that's done with the with the hybrid solver, correct? Or is it yes. done with? Yes. Okay, so that's with the. Yes. With the of the DOS black box. Yes. Um, are you using any uh, sparsifying constraints over here, right? Uh, we are not using any constraints so far here. So and this... any and any sense of sparsity uh, that you try to introduce into the into the reconstruction that you would guide the solution towards uh, one That's that it. can be explained with like an Occam's razor or a fewest atoms elements kind of approach. Because yeah. I think that's that's what the ETH paper that you have alluded to was doing, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. I think they are, yeah. I think they 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 have this kind of kind of approach, uh, as you said, that you introduce some kind of sparsity constraint, and with the super resolution problem, it is easier to do that because they focus on uh, patches in the image, right? And then they just mm -hmm. they they can disregard basically most of the image, and then also their cubo matrix. It's not as fully connected anymore. So this would be something interesting to try out. I have not introduced that so far. So we just basically took our initial assumption. What we did, however, um, what is common practice in image reconstruction techniques is that you introduce some kind of regularization term into uh, the objective. 
So we have tried to, or we have uh, introduced an uh, L2 uh, regularization term, which is yeah, just pretty common practice in, in image reconstruction. And uh, we have seen that particularly for this uh, integer uh, valued reconstruction case, that this could guide the solution a little bit more to the correct um, to the correct answer. But um, the sparsifying constraint that you you said, I think this is a really crucial part to kind of make the problem more suitable for uh, the quantum annealer itself. Yeah, so, so it makes it NP hard in the end, right? Because yes. uh, I think the other the other uh, the other algorithms that you have here are deterministic or, or polynomial time, right? Uh, as opposed to the uh, more Penrose pseudo inverse calculation, you don't actually calculate the pseudo inverse. You just, uh, I suppose, run LSQR, right? Like Page Sanders uh, LSQR type uh, algorithm. Or uh... yeah, I just so uh, for the for the pseudo inverse, I just run the the Python uh, NumPy linalg uh, p inf, which is yeah, the like. Oh, okay, so it's, so that could also be a Gaussian elimination or something as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, just based on. I mean, it's based on the SVD, uh, so I, yeah. Okay, so you can you can do then uh, something much uh, equally as good and cheaper by just running uh, LSQR, a second like algorithm mm -hmm. from uh, mid '80s. Uh, that that uh, I come from uh, from seismic imaging, so we try to image uh -huh. the subsurface. Uh -huh. uh, so that's uh, something that we use uh, a lot, okay. Okay. Uh, and that's a. Uh, that scales linearly, and you can add uh, all, uh, all kinds of stabilizers and regularizers uh -huh. in there as uh -huh. well. So, okay, so it works quite well. Okay, yeah, um, that, that would be something to to test out. Yeah, thank you. And and, and a follow up question: You said something about problem size, right? You said yeah. you're, you're dealing with a thirty two by thirty two. Yeah. Um, how large? How many? How many variables uh, do you end up with by the time you send it over to the quantum manualer? So, give or take. By the time we send it to the quantum annealer, what we can disregard is basically the basically the reconstruction circle of the image. So um, when we rotate the image, we're kind of restricted to only the inner part of the image. So um, it's not by a lot, but in principle, it's kind of thirty-two by thirty-two variables that we're being returned minus a bit on the on the on the edges. I don't know. Okay, so so an order of one thousand or so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you can. With the with the hybrid solver, you can push it by another three orders of magnitude easily, right? Yeah, it's it's pretty. I think they even mentioned that in principle you could extend it to like half a million binary uh, yeah. variables. Um, yeah, but uh, for for us, then the problem comes with the problem formulation because then our matrix explodes in size, and uh, the make the the problem formulation just takes a lot longer because the way that uh, they make the problem on the hybrid solver you have to bring it into this specific set objective into a string kind of format so uh -huh. it's inherently limited by 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 that kind of oh because your cubo has uh exactly. half a million squared number of elements so you exactly. have to be clever about exactly. how you how you represent it uh, exactly. uh, i see i see the, exactly. the hurdle there and we have for for a um for, for this problem, what we used in the very beginning was uh, SymPy. SymPy is a you know symbolic Python package where you can um, express uh, vectors, matrices. But we have now um, implemented this kind of on our own, and it works a lot faster. And the hope was also to scale uh, the image size up with this. But uh, this is a project that a student of mine is working on uh, for his bachelor uh, for his bachelor uh, project. And um, once we have some results there, I'm, 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 I hope that uh, we can actually boost up the the image size with regards to that too. So last question, if I may, Paul. Sure. This, yeah. Sure. Um, the the binary versus integer, right? Uh -huh. uh, when you're trying to do a fixed point arithmetic or just a sort of series of two that you mentioned to represent yeah. your integer, yeah, uh, you're closing the spectral gap in the in the in the in the quantum annealer, so uh, you're no longer your likelihood of remaining in a ground state mm. at the end of the annual mm. uh, drops somehow. I think that mm -hmm. exponentially, or, or there's some mm -hmm. some prediction on that, um, especially for 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 matrix inversion kind of problems. Mm -hmm. For your application, um, how how important it is that you have integers, uh, or are binary variables just good enough, or maybe this just is... a, a two point. Uh, uh, two-bit uh, representation for an integer 
This is really, this is an interesting question. And uh, this is something that a lot of people had a discussion also about in this medical imaging um, kind of context. So it really differs from the application side. So if we take the, uh, um, for example, the problem from the very beginning where we want to um, really quantitatively know how much activity is in the patient, then this of course boils down to, uh, you want to have it as precise as possible. However, there are scenarios where it's feasible to make um, the reconstruction discrete, so just have it binary. So that would be like, for example, in a non-destructive te testing where you would have like a metal object, right? But even in uh, medical image reconstruction, if we would work with phantoms to begin with, for example, where we know that the um, distribution of the radioactivity should be somewhat uniform, we could, I think it is, vi um, it is viable to make that assumption. But um, we are also working with, for example, uh, techniques where it is only um, where you would only have to distinguish between two, three, four materials, for example. And for that to boost up, I think that would be a realistic case. And you could think about this, for example, if you want to distinguish materials in a computer tomography problem. So you want to distinguish, you know, water and um, I don't know, bone tissue uh, and so on and so forth. So this would be a valid assumption that you could make. Um, I don't think that we are really at the point yet where we can uh, use this technique in, in you know, clinical practice or, or somewhere else. But I think that it probably these are the kind of scenarios that you would end up translating the problem to and that would be useful to do with if a, there is really a, a, also a lot of a lot of discussion going on so um do we really need floating point um precision if we just uh, represent the images for the doctor um on a, a finite grayscale level right um in the end, the images are being interpreted by the doctor, and the doctor really just looks for patterns in the image. So there is there is a discussion also going on about that. But I think that really for some of these discrete tomography uh, cases where you use binary or maybe four different regions, this could be something that would be maybe applicable. And I think that is a very uh, valid uh, concern that you raise with this um, you know, that the, the quantum annealer, it may not round to the nearest number as we are used to, right, in uh, in classical computing, kind of. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, uh, I suppose that's one way of interpreting it. Yeah, no, but uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the, for, the, for the explanation and for the topic. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think uh, we have uh, had some some discussions. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And thanks, uh, Merlin, for this very interesting talk. And I'll uh, see you again in the next uh, next meeting. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.